Welcome to MIT. Uh, welcome to the the fifth annual Code Conference. I can't believe it's the fifth year. It's fantastic to see uh, old friends and some new faces as well. Uh, we have, since its inception, been really excited about this conference because we think this topic is really important. We think that it's moving very quickly, uh, and so getting together once a year with top experts uh, is, is really valuable for us in terms of building knowledge and, and uh, continuing our learning and so on. So we're really thankful for all of you uh, for being here uh, and really excited for the conference. Just wanted to uh, say a couple of thank yous and to give you a couple of notes about the conference this year. Uh, first of all, every year we get a record, record number of submissions. So every year there's more submissions than there were uh, in previous years. Uh, we try to not grow the conference uh, to be too big because we think that this size is a really nice uh, intimate size for, for learning and for having people have the opportunity to interact with one another. As you know, the, um, the format of the conference favors discussion. So the presentations are short on purpose so that we can favor more conversation and questioning and, uh, and, and we think that that's a, a better way to put this conference on. Um, and so uh, that's why we, we curate the quality of the, of the presentations very uh, intensely. Uh, but needless to say, again, this year we had a record number of submissions. Uh, it's growing every year, so we're very, very happy to see the interest growing in the topic and in the conference. Uh, you know, as, as, it, as with every year, uh, Eric Brynjolfs and myself and Sandy Pentland uh, are organizing the conference, but uh, this year I need to uh, officially thank uh, three additional people uh, and one of and promote one of them. Uh, so this year, um, because of a lot of different reasons and because we, we needed smarter minds at the helm, uh, we brought in some uh, really important people that helped us uh, review, curate uh, papers and, and put the program together. Um, and those three people are uh, first Dean Eccles, who's an assistant professor here at the Sloan School. If we could give a big round of applause to Dean. Uh, Michael, Michael Zhao, uh, who is a PhD student here in the IT group. Michael. And uh, Dave Holtz, who's also a PhD student here in the IT group. Uh, we really appreciated all of their effort in, uh, in helping us curate this year's conference. Uh, they've done a fantastic job. Uh, it, you know, the, the conference is great. I'm so excited to see it. Uh, in terms of Dean, we have formally asked Dean to join the organizing committee and the program committee uh, of the conference. So going forward, myself, Eric, Sandy, and Dean will be putting on uh, the conference on digital experimentation. Um, we didn't take this lightly, so let me just tell you a couple of words about Dean. Uh, in my mind, Dean is one of the foremost world's experts on digital experimentation. Uh, he is, in my mind, you know, almost unequivocally one of, if not the most uh, advanced young scholar in this field. Uh, I think it's important for us to recognize that, and it's certainly important for MIT and for uh, Eric, Sandy, and I uh, to um, uh, you know, bring him on to the organizing committee and the program committee so that uh, this uh, conference continues to be the world-leading conference uh, on this topic. So thank you very much, Dean. We really appreciate all of your help. Um, a couple of housekeeping announcements, which I'll keep short. All the plenary sessions in the fireside panel will occur here on the seventh floor. Obviously, the plenary speakers have 20 minutes to present their work. Between each of the two speakers in the plenaries, we can accommodate a clarifying question or two as they transition. Then after both speakers have presented, we'll open the floor to the discussion and the questions as we do every year. For all plenary sessions and the fireside panel, please use the microphones to ask your questions so that we can hear everybody um, uh, uh, and make sure you, you have the microphone before asking your question so we don't have to repeat it. 
For the parallel sessions, all of them will occur on the sixth floor, one floor below. Each speaker will have 12 minutes, and then between speakers, we'll accommodate a couple of clarifying questions. After the speakers have presented, we'll open the floor to the discussion, and the session shares should be keeping time and, and making sure all of this happens. So um, I think that's about it. With that, I will turn it over to Eric, who's going to curate the first session. Thanks. Thanks, Sinan, and I, let me just uh, briefly add my uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, we're so delighted to see this uh, amazing group of people here. Uh, every year, uh, the quality and the quantity of people participating goes up. When we, when we started this uh, five years ago, uh, we didn't know for sure. I, I think we had some suspicions that this was going to really catch on and be successful, but it, it's really exceeded even our very high expectations. So we're happy about that. Um, some of the characteristics of this, in addition to the, to the quality, is also that we bring together industry and academia. And I think that's something you're seeing more and more in the field. And you'll see from uh, the speakers today, in fact, including the very first panel, that we have a mix of people from different areas. Um, so let me, and, and then a third thing, actually, that, that is uh, uh, unusual about this conference compared to others is that we give very brief introductions of our speakers. So we have more time for the, for the uh, content. So with that, let me uh, briefly introduce our first two speakers, uh, Susan Athey from Stanford and Ron Kahavi from Microsoft. Uh, Susan, can you come on up and get us started? Susan Athey. Actually, did you, oh, there's click up, very good. Great, it's wonderful to see everybody, and I, I really love this conference. Thank you guys so much for making it happen. Um, I, I get so much out of this every year, and I, I love all the people that I meet and getting to learn so much from all of you. So um, as in, for these plenary sessions, I, I want to have kind of a mix of some uh, motivating big picture questions to, to have a discussion as well as a few advertisements for more technical talks. So let's see if I can pull this off. Um, I've been working on uh, bandits and contextual bandits for the last couple of years and been really trying to think about how we can change the way we do experimentation both um, in industry and in academia. Let's see. Is it clicking? Um, yeah. Up oh, there we go. All right, it's happy now. Um, so one of the things that's motivating me most recently, and and something that I've been thinking about about a lot at, at Stanford in the last uh, few months, is how we can within um, use our our launching pad in academia to try to solve social problems. So I've spent a lot of time working with and learning from tech firms. And, and, I, and it's really fun and awesome to solve uh, their problems and to, to advance the state of knowledge inside a tech company. But it's also, there's also a lot of problems society is facing where the tools we've been developing could be really helpful. And so if we think about solving various kinds of social problems, things like adult literacy, retraining workers, and so on, um, many aspects of the digital revolution allow us to have new solutions. Um, we can reach consumers directly through their phones. We might be able to measure consumers' interactions with, uh, with, uh, with digital products. We can educate and encourage consumers to do things. We can encourage them to vote. Of course, we're all getting prompted to vote a lot recently, so we know that's a good kind of influence. Um, we can say, try get them to save for retirement, lose weight, learn to read, et cetera. And the low marginal cost of the delivery of the interventions also make them really good candidates for something that we can do some R&D, but then really scale social interventions easily to reach unreached populations. And a last thing that I think has really been uh, slightly underappreciated in the, at least the economics community that's out there trying to solve social problems is that the thing that's really made all of our tech companies work is incremental innovation guided by ongoing A-B testing rather than sitting in a garage coming up with a great idea and sending it out. And so we have these amazingly awesome institutions here at MIT. There's JPAL where people do randomized experiments to see what works in development. But it's a very slow process. And you know, if we think about what we do, we, we might try something okay tweet, and then spend right? a year or two testing it and then find out maybe it doesn't work. And I think when we, when we weigh the tech firms work is usually like the first version of the product actually doesn't work 
really well. Like search engines weren't really very good <laughs> when we started them. And instead you make them better and better. And so I wanna try to bring those ideas into the development community as well as new communities that haven't been using um, so much of that. And so I would say the research agenda here would, would be to use theoretical and empirical social science to identify targets of opportunity to prototype, test, and develop interventions at universities in collaboration with various industries and organizations, and then potentially use economic incentives and philanthropy to scale. And a lot of people like Eric Schmidt has been funding some of this for us at, at Stanford are very interested in, in doing this. And so at Stanford, we're starting a new thing called the Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence um, Initiative, where we are um, trying to, to, to do, bring some of these things to practice. And then a specific initiative inside of that, that for shared prosperity and innovation, trying to bring tech solutions to social problems. And so, um, again, a key component of this, or a key area where I think this can be really successful is in teaching, nudging, and persuading humans where it's still not very clear what works. Just as an example, like worker retraining programs are very blunt and they're one size fits all. I'm working with Justine Hastings' lab in Rhode Island that can merge all of the administrative data for the entire state together. We can see for whom did worker training programs work and not work. Um, they had a randomized experiment for that, and we found that, for example, um, men who had narrow skills actually were discouraged by the reemployment services that we provided to them, and this that doing this using machine learning to find the groups that work and don't work can, can propose new places for innovation and then we could potentially design and, and iteratively improve uh, better programs. And so generally, the idea is let's get this incremental innovation revolution um, into practice. So what have I been doing um, to try to uh, make this happen? And of course, there's many components and what our research contributions will be you know, incremental uh, towards this broader agenda. Um, one of the things we've been building at Stanford is a, a platform for experiments with things like Mechanical Turk workers or Google surveys or people we might recruit on Facebook that allow us to prototype nudges and interventions um, before we actually send them out into the field with real, uh, with real market participants. And our platform has modular components for the analyst, all the different components of how you do the bandits, how you tune them. Um, we have software to help uh, simulate environments and then try to um, do power analysis if you want to do hypothesis tests afterwards and, and so on. And then producing a scorecard after running the bandit. So we've been, this is quite a big project and we're just a few uh, academics, so this has taken some time to get going and we're just getting started now running our first experiments. Uh, Joseph J. Williams, who I met here, and I are working on some stuff um, with our, our labs on charitable giving, and then I also have collaborations with the World Bank where we're looking to do contraceptive advice, um, Ideas 42 where we're looking at first generation college students, um, IPA, uh, PayPal where we're also looking at charitable giving, and in each case we want to do more um, incremental experimentation to, for these social problems. But in, in the process of doing this, this has actually spurred some interesting research, just as, of course, all of you know, you tend to get your research ideas when you're trying to put things into practice. And one of the things that was clear when trying to take the development community and these, these um, charitable organizations uh, on the next step of the journey is that they're used to doing simple randomized controlled trials with a nice uh, set of power calculations and scorecards at the end. And so if I replace that with something like a contextual bandit that's m maximizing utility or minimizing regret, and I, don't, I can't test the hypothesis at the end, that's going to be a little funny to that community. And often, really, the goal for these communities is are multifaceted. They need to go and show the World Bank, hey, this works. They need to test hypotheses at the end. And we realize that some of the algorithms, while they're very good for finding good policies, might leave you with data sets that make it hard to test hypotheses at the end. And so um, our idea for, for one of these uh, research projects is to actually use bandits not just as a way to, to minimize regret and find the best allocation of people coming through a platform, but also as a way to efficiently collect data for scientific discovery. 
but then we need to modify the algorithms. And in particular, we need to have a way to balance our competing objectives. One objective is to find an optimal personalized policy, targeted policy, but another alter goal is to test hypotheses. And so our idea is to bring in costs into the learning. And in particular, um, if we make a cost of, for personalization, so we say, you can choose different policies, but if you're going to personalize, if you're going to contextualize, then you, you have to bear a cost of doing that. And what that will do is it'll force the algorithm to spend time exploring simpler policies, and it'll make sure that when you're done, there's a clear separation between more complex policies and simpler policies. And uh, that might actually help represent what's really happening in reality, like we might think that well, there's, that actually the reason people don't want complicated policies is that it's hard to manage complicated policies. Or if you're in a tech company, you know, if I have to do a function call and you know, figure out what the best personalized thing is, that's gonna slow down my algorithm. So I should really only do that if I really have a good reason to. Um, and so w putting in these costs in a Bayesian framework of Thompson sampling will allow us to naturally achieve multiple objectives without adding 50 million tuning parameters. So just for, with some formalism, what is a bandit? I'm choosing between alternative arms. My subjects are arriving IID. I'm gonna have a, 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 every period I have a history I can look back on, and I'm trying to map from my history to um, probability distributions over treatments. And our goal is to, in the typical goal in the bandit literature is to minimize regret, which basically means I wanna, I wanna get as close as possible to giving people the best uh, policy. I've written here the notation for non-contextual bandits where I'm just choosing different arms. The Thompson sampling approach, heuristic for solving this problem is to assign um, treatments in proportion to the probability that the arm is best given the historical data. Um, if I wanna think about hypothesis testing after a bandit, just if we take a simple two-arm case, um, if I wanna test that the arms are equal, then I would, if I was only concerned about that, I would worry about the variance of the test statistic, and if both arms have equal variance, that's basically gonna mean that I would keep allocating traffic to each arm equally. And of course, that's useful for testing a hypothesis, but at some point, you know, there's sort of diminishing returns to your t-statistic, right? Like at some point, you know, I really know arm A is better than arm B, and I don't really care anymore about getting that test more accurate. Instead, I might wanna actually just know, well, how good is arm A? And so th that, that's a different objective. Figuring out how good is arm A is actually the, is the same objective as minimizing regret, because that minimizing regret means giving everybody the best arm. But the more people I put in the best arm, the more precise my estimates of that arm. So this is this very simple example just highlights the trade-off between regret and hypothesis testing. I can take that to K arms. Um, if I wanted to test whether the one arm is, 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 is better than a random arm, then I would allocate equally between the best arm and a random arm. Um, if I'm, on the other hand, if I wanna see if anything works, I would wanna put as much as possible into the best arm, which again is regret is putting everything in the best arm versus testing. So in the contextual bandit, we have a similar kind of problem, but now people have covariates and I observe things about people. So now I have a more complicated problem because I wanna understand what's the best arm for each person. And we can say there's crossover effects if the optimal policy actually depends on those axes. Um, and, and one big question would be, do I actually, it, can I actually uh, prove that, in fact, we do need to personalize? As we know, treatment effects are hard enough to measure. It's even harder to show that different people should get different treatments with precision. So learning about that is very tricky. It's a very good environment for thinking about bandits because you never have enough data to solve this problem and you really wanna use every data point well. So, you know, when we think about a decision maker's approach, we can think about whether it matters which arm to use, is personalization worthwhile, as well as what are expected outcomes with a good personalized policy. And so our proposal is instead of just optimizing for the last question and putting everybody in the best policy, um, we should uh, introduce a cost. So we're gonna have like sub bandits, so there's a cost of doing anything that's personalized and it's cheaper to use uniform policies. And we're gonna incorporate this into a Bayesian style bandit, and we're gonna use Thompson sampling to select between all the uniform policies or the non-personalized policies and the best personalized policy. 
Um, now, we, I, we have to think, be precise about what we're going to do at the end. We're going to test a hypothesis um, about, we're going to test hypotheses about policies. And so we have to take seriously that at the end of the bandit, we need to actually estimate a personalized policy and then construct a confidence interval for that personalized policy. And because we have been using non-random assignment, it's actually a hard problem. We controlled the assignment, but different x's are assigned to different treatments with different prob probabilities. And so in particular, if we misspecify our outcome model, if we misspecify our conditional mean function, and we don't account for the fact that, that for, for some x's we have more treatment arm one, and for other x's we have more treatment arm two, we can end up with biased estimates. And so this problem has gotten a lot of attention in the, in the causal inference literature over many decades. Um, and we built, we, in, a, in a paper um, with a student, Zhu, and my co-author, Stefan Wager, we, uh, we propose a way to use uh, historical data in a non-random in a, in a non assignment or non-uniform random assignment setting um, to estimate policies. And so what we propose in this paper is based on the semi-parametric efficiency literature, where we basically propose these double robust scores and they have this property that even if you misspecify your conditional mean function, you still actually get a, get a consistent um, estimate of the benefit of any particular policy. And so we basically then set up the problem of finding the best policy as a, as a classification problem where for each observation, you, each observation is going to have a, a contribution to figuring out um, whether each arm is good. And so for each person, I'm going to use a CrossFit predictive model. So I'm not going to use your own data to make your, the predictions for each person. So a random forest out of bag will be really good for this. And so for each person, I'm going to say, for, for each person's characteristics and each arm, there's going to be a basic prediction of how good that would be. But then if you actually received a particular arm, I'm going to add on to that the residual from a regression weighted by the propensity score, or how, how likely you were to have been allocated that arm to reweight to, to make it look like the original distribution of x's. And then I, you, you just do an empirical minimization where I say, all right, for each of you, there's some benefit I'm, 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 I'm attributing to each arm. That's really the score from an econometric model. And I'm going to try to allocate you to the arm that looks best for you. And we're going to consider a limited class of, of policies that could incorporate budget constraints or simplicity complexity constraints. And we have a theorem that shows that this gives this is an efficient estimator. And so these are the best known bounds, um, improving on all exi previously existing bounds for finding optimal policies um, for this problem. So OK, so, one, so that's basically, at the end of it, there's an algorithm to try to estimate what the best policy is. We also have to think about how to construct variances. Now, we, we have the property that we did the assignment, so can we know how you were assigned conditional on the x because we did it ourselves. Um, but there is a little bit of non-independence going on because the out outcomes in, say, the first batch affect the assignments in the later batch. Now, I don't think this is actually going to be a big deal in practice, but we're suggesting a parametric bootstrap to, to account for that um, correlation, although it doesn't seem to matter too much in practice. And actually, I should mention also, um, we, we also use this kind of doubly robust estimation um, in the process of doing the bandit. And in another paper, um, we, we show that that doubly robust learning during the bandit learning uh, improves upon, it, 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 theoretically, it works as well as any existing bounds. And we show that it works well um, in practice. OK, so getting back to the, the personalization cost, let me just show you how this works in a specific example. So I just do a, a really simple problem where there's only two contexts. You're either a low or a high, and there's three arms. And the ranking of the arms depends on the context. If you're low, the, the first arm is good. If you're, if you're high, the, the third arm is good. And I'm going to have a cost of using personalized policies. And again, the role of that cost is going to be to make sure I do enough exploration of uniform policies so that afterwards I can actually do a hypothesis test to say, did personalization improve? So um, in running a little version of this algorithm, we see on the x-axis I have the personalization costs. And sort of not surprisingly, as we increase the costs, um, we spend more time using the best uh, uniform policy and, uh, and less time doing personalization during the bandit. 
And what that's going to do, again, as I spend more time uh, exploring uniform policies, that's going to decrease the variance of a hypothesis test between the best personalized policy and the best uniform policy and increase the variance of our estimator of how good the very best policy is. Um, and then here's a little picture that shows as I march, as I go through the, the costs, how do I distribute my, my, um, my observations to the different arms? It, when the cost is low, it's highly personalized. We're, we're sending most of the people with low types um, to, to, the, to arm one or arm three. Um, I mean, with low types to arm one, and then most of the people with the high types to arm three. And as I increase the cost, I allocate a little more data to the middle, which helps me do the hypothesis tests um, at the end. So here's a, I actually did a little uh, example to where I can make it even, like really spell out even more what's going on. Actually, I did this as a UCB example rather than Thompson sampling, just because you send whole chunks of data to the same algorithm. And so I, here I'm marching across on the x-axis the batches, and then I have two columns. One is for the case where there's no personalization cost, and one for the case where there is personalization cost. And the red are the, are the best, um, are, are, the, are the things that are best. And so in this particular case, in the first batch, we, do, we did random assignment, and so we figure out that personalization looks good. And even though I'm imposing a cost, personalization still looks like the best option. So, in this, so then in the second batch, I've learned, I've learned something about assigning low people to, to, arm, uh, to, the, to the first arm and high people to the third arm. But after that, I've, I've, I've shrunk some uncertainty about those, but then, I, then I'm still uncertain about the benefit of uniform arms. And so in the case where there's a cost, I start, um, I start bouncing around. So I, I assign everybody to arm, to arm number one or the second arm. Then I assign everybody to the third arm in the third batch. Then I go to the, um, to the, to the last arm. Then I go back to the middle arm. And so in the, in the bandit that has the cost, I'm, I bounce around a little bit between uniform policies until I'm pretty sure that each of the uniform policies isn't good. And by the end, I figured out that, the that actually the personalized policies are better than the uniform policies. While the uniform bandit, basically after the first bat, I mean the, the personalized bandit with the low costs always personalizes. It figures out very quickly that personalization is good, and so it allocates all of the low types to the first arm and all of the high types to the last arm, and it never really explores the other things. And so I, I, I did this little example to find, just find parameter values where you could show at the end of this, with the, with the high cost of personalization bandit, at the end, I can reject the hypothesis that personalization is the same as the uniform policy, but with the, the bandit with, without a personalization cost, at the end, I actually can't reject the hypothesis that personalization is equal to uniform policies. And so putting this cost in is just a nice tuning parameter and a way to make sure I can test the hypotheses at the end. So just to conclude, um, the, the big picture is that I'm trying to improve experimentation, and I actually have a lot of customers. I have customers like World Bank people who are used to doing year or two long randomized trials and having clear hypothesis tests at the end. Um, and I want to, I have scientific learning objectives. Maybe I want to publish a paper, and I heard they care about T-statistics. Um, <laughs> maybe they shouldn't, but they do. And so I, I want to, um, I want to make sure that I can test hypotheses at the end of this. I want to have some sort of principled, coherent way to balance my different objectives of my different customers. And putting a cost of, of complexity or a, com a cost of, of customization in there is one way to make sure that I, I balance the bandit without, the, we first tried a whole bunch of tuning parameters and we realized this sort of one simple way gave you an interpretable parameter that would, that would balance competing objectives. Um, it helps guide you towards more power. Of course, you might ask in the end, why did we want those T statistics and why is it that people won't publish my paper without them and should the World Bank care about a hypothesis test in the end or should they be a Bayesian decision maker at the end? Um, maybe we, should, we can retrain the world to all be Bayesian decision makers, but in, in the meantime, it can be nice to be able to, to test these hypotheses and so that's what we're working on. Um, great, thanks.
Susan. So the format is that uh, Ron is now going to speak for 20 minutes, and then I'll ask Susan and Ron both to come back up onto the stage, and all of you will have a chance to ask them some questions. So start thinking about what your questions are. So here's Ron Kahavi. <laughs> Thank you. I'll wait for this to come up. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about a fun topic uh, that has, that I was basically forced to study a little bit more because I work at Microsoft. We run a lot of controlled experiments. Uh, now at Microsoft, about every day we start 50 to 100 controlled experiments. So a large number of controlled experiments run, and yet we got into trouble because people started to misunderstand the value of what we're doing relative to other studies that were done. So this is, this is motivated uh, by a few things. One of them is Randy Monroe's uh, fun cartoon. I think the, you're probably all familiar with it, but I think the hover text is really important, which is it's not that observational studies are bad, it's that you should view them really as suggesting something, but it's unproven yet, and you have to, to go there um, and prove it. And, and this is really my motivation, which is there's lots of people showing some studies. Hey, look, A and B impact each other, but it's all done through an observation. Um, people are aware of this statement. Everybody's heard that correlation does not imply causation. There was a recent talk that Amy Hood, our CFO, gave, and she made sort of an obvious observational claim, and then she said, we're going to incent the sales force because of this. Um, and I said, hey, you know, after the talk, I mailed her. I said, you know, observation doesn't imply causation. She said, come on, I know that. I said, why'd you talk imply that? I didn't, I, she inherently didn't understand the problem. Um, everybody's seen the exam example that carrying umbrellas is an excellent predictor of rain. Uh, people laugh when you tell them, let's ban umbrellas. But then when there's an observational study that shows that their feature lowers attrition, they start to celebrate. Right? And that's an obvious observational claim. Um, and the, the problem, the interesting problem, I said to you that we run about 50 to 100 controlled experiments every day. We got people used to the fact that you should trust the results of our studies. And then when somebody else shows a study, not everybody understands that there is a main difference between a controlled experiment and an observational study, so the alarm bells don't go off. Um, so I think this is one of the key, key claims is it's a good way to generate hypotheses. You then have to test them. But I also think that this is the problem with a lot of people. They come up with observational study and you say, is it wrong? I can't tell you that it's wrong. It may be right. The chances that it's right are low, as hopefully these examples will show you. And this is why I started generating them. This was actually the key motivation. We had two studies. In Microsoft Office, each basically made this claim, people who use my feature churn less. Uh, and this was presented at some all-hands meeting in front of a lot of people. Everybody said, great, we should build these features. But what we did is basically say, look, you cannot tell based on this. Uh, it may improve or it may degrade retention. We just don't know based on this observational study. And this example actually worked well, which is we showed that people that see more errors churn less, right? So if you, if you saw that, now people start to get the umbrella example, which is, my God, we shouldn't start displaying more errors. But it is true. Heavy users see more errors, and heavy users churn less, and heavy users, you know, <laughs> cause these two things. And so this helped a lot. And I'm going to show you a lot of these examples where researchers have failed to account for some things. Um, and, you know, one of these things, if you have... Uh, I think most of you probably seen this is this uh, hierarchy of evidence which says you know at the top you have these you know multiple replicated uh, RCTs randomized control trials and as you go lower and lower you should trust it less and less okay so let me start with the examples the fun stuff so there's this great book and it says for 2400 years patient believed the doctors were doing them good for 2300 meaning except for the last century they were actually wrong who knows what, like, the worst mistake the doctors have done over almost 2,000 years? Bloodletting. Since the first century, doctors believe that, you know, if you just bloodlet, all the evil will come out. 
And so they built this device that allows you to puncture a hole and let the blood out. And this is correlational, right? You blood let, if you ever had your blood taken out, it's calming. <laughs> right? You're like, relax, you scream less. <laughs> Um, so very, very correlational, and you know, you look at books, and it's like recommended for every possible disease out there. Uh, it's a very efficient treatment. Um, and then, you know, if you do something, why well, don't you make it more efficient, right? Bring leeches. They suck the blood faster. So here's an amazing fact. In 1833, 42 million leeches were brought in to France for medicinal purposes. Okay, so how bad was this? Actually, pretty amazing. So George Washington rode in the snow, got sick. Doctor came in, did bloodletting. Didn't help. Second doctor came in, did bloodletting. Didn't help. The third doctor came in, did bloodletting. Didn't help. Today, we estimate that half his blood was removed, and he died that night. Right? So our first president probably died you know, prematurely because... Doctors believed they were doing them good. By the way, he personally believed that this was useful and encouraged the doctors to do it because he saw that it was very effective with his slaves. <laughs> okay, so then, you know, where's the control study? Well, 1836, Dr. Louis took 77 patients from a fairly homogenous group. Uh, they had the same form of pneumonia, and he analyzed them. He did bloodletting early, and he did bloodletting later. And what do you know? 44% of patients that bled early died. Only 25% that were bled late died. And so his conclusion was probably really bad for you. Could be fatal. Um, another example. So this is going to be just a set of examples uh, that are really sort of convincing. So here's a great study. 50 million users at Yahoo. Question is, do display ads work? Okay, so when you do a display ad, you show MIT code. Do people search for something that has to do with this ad, right? So brands use it all the time. And the question is, what do you do? Well, so you do an observational study. This was done a huge amount of time at the time. And if you do this straight up, you'll conclude about 1,200% lift to people who search for your terms. Okay, but this is obviously just straight, right? We gotta do a few corrections. So if you do a regression and you put control variables in, you get significantly less, about 894. If you stick in everything you've got, you get down to 871. You look at the confidence intervals, they're about plus or minus 10% on this, you know, 800% lift. Then you run the controlled experiment. And wait for it, wait for it. Anybody guess? 5.4. Kind of a big difference from that 800%. This is the number we trust, right? This is the controlled experiment, the observational study, and there's a whole discussion in the paper about why the numbers are so off, but it has to do with basically you have to account for factors that are really hard to account. Um, okay, next example. Nightlight causes myopia, right? Very famous at the time. You look at the articles, it was posted in papers. Children that sleep with nightlight until they're two have higher myopia, okay? And there's this beautiful table, and you can look at this, and the graphs are really impressive. There's massive lift on that graph on the right, people that have room lights, or even the middle one, people that have night lights. And the conclusion that Dr. Quinn says, do not put your people in a lighted room, put them in the dark. Okay, that last statement is a causal claim Again, could be true, may not be true. We have to run the controlled experiments. It's hard to control for that, obviously. So people started to rep tried to replicate it. A year later, same journal, two research reports showed up. They could not find the similar pattern, but they did make a really interesting observation. Common cause. If the parents are myopic, they're likely to employ nightlights. And myopic is hereditary. <laughs> And when you see that, you're like, okay, guys. <laughs> First study, not very reliable once you're aware of this common cause. But common causes are hard to find. These confounders are hard to find. But here's one where they did that. So there's an observational study in the Lancet, despite the name. The first example I showed you means that device wasn't very effective. It is a famous journal. 
Um, it showed that vitamin C reduces coronary heart disease. Okay, later on, an article appeared. Actually, sorry guys, it increases coronary heart disease. Which one should you believe? Well, the latter is higher in the hierarchy of evidence. But then people started to say, why did we get it wrong? And then you see that basically there's this nice paper that says, look, we look at all the confounders, we look at all the attributes of the people in the studies, in the observational study, and they are just very different. So look at all these factors that are stat sig at point zero, 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 0001. Social class, number of bathrooms in the house, shared bathroom, car access, smoker, exercise. All these are different between the people in the two groups. And that is just hard, really, really hard to control for. Right? So, of course, we know how to do this better. Uh, you think so? It's very, very hard because we may never know for controlling for all the confounders or what's called causal sufficiency. Here's an interesting one. Observational study claimed youngsters who lose their virginity earlier than their peers are more likely to become juvenile delinquents. Everybody says, wow, this is like what I believe in, right? This is a good thing. The government funds these programs for abstinence. Here's the proof. And the paper was really good. It controlled for everything that you might think. Gender, race, public assistance, all this, even the last one, virginity pledge status, right? So this is like really, really well run, right? You can't get this one wrong. Well, we believe it's wrong. And the reason we believe it wrong is that a PhD student called Paige Harding, I, like I need to click from here only. <laughs> Batteries, okay. Um, so she used the same database as in the original study and says, look, I'm going to look at identical twins, right? In the hierarchy of evidence, you're able to do something with identical twins. You are controlling for factors that are unobserved, right? Genetics. Um, and she showed the opposite. <laughs> it's actually in the other direction. And they interviewed the original authors and they admitted that they now agree that their study is flawed. Right, so this is really, really hard um, to do that because of causal sufficiency. Okay, so this doesn't work. I need you to either replace the batteries or I'll, I'll just do page down. <laughs> okay. Um, so the last example, which I think is probably one of the, the most amazing examples I've seen, which has to do with time sensitivity. So there's a large observational study with 50,000 women in the nurse's health study. And it, they followed them for 16 years to look at something that the doctors believe was useful, which is hormone replacement therapy. Thank you. Um, so they concluded that hormone replacement therapy reduces coronary heart disease. And this was such an amazing study that doctors started prescribing this in large quantities. You can see there, there's one of the drugs for HRT, Premarin. Was, was the number three subscribed dr drug in the United States. So like this was like caught on, everybody was doing it. Um, okay. Um, and then they ran the randomized control trial. What do you know? Opposite. It was so bad, they stopped the study early because women were dying. Right, so it was planned for eight and a half years. It was terminated after 5.2 because the overall risk exceeded the benefits. It's kind of interesting, actually. They stopped it when it was stat sig at 0.05. Until they managed to stop, actually more data came in. It was not stat sig, so they were like debating what to do at that point. But no, they decided this is close enough. They wanted to stop this. Um, but what's the, what's the confounder here, which is really interesting? The time of usage. So it turns out when you look at the problem, when you first start to use HRT, yeah. Thanks. the risk is really, really high. And then if you don't die in the first couple of years, then you're probably okay. So the problem with the observational study, okay, this is like when I press it. Like, can you go back one slide? Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, so the, the problem with this is the women that died, that were in the observational study, basically died early 
right? You were not going to get in the observational study if you took hormone replacement therapy, you died early. So the observational study was run. Those women that used HRT early didn't get into the study. So pretty, pretty amazing result. Of course, very, very hard to control for. Um, and so then the next study, you know, one of those interesting papers is this Young and Carr paper. They looked at 52 claims in medicine across multiple domains and then found matching uh, control studies um, zero replicated, zero replicated of all these claims. Five were statsig in the opposite direction. Uh, so they have this sort of a funny thing about any claim coming from an observational study is most likely to be wrong. Okay, so I'm done. My ask to you is if you have cool uh, examples that I haven't included, I'd love to get them. Uh, this is, you know, based on some earlier stuff that I wrote. I refreshed it. For this talk, um, thank you very much. Stay up and Susan can come up and join us. And uh, just so before I open it up to the uh, audience for questions, let me uh, ask a couple of questions. I'll start with you, uh, Susan. So that was really interesting, and it just it's very compelling that this is the right way to do things in, in many ways. But but let me just think of a, some potential concerns or risks. So one is, um, is there a risk that you get trapped in a local mi maximum, you know, that, that you sort of say, hey, this looks better, and now you're not exploring the other dimension as much, and does, as you improve the odds of doing the right thing, do you maybe also improve the, worsen the odds that you miss on some fluky, better thing? Absolutely. So I would say that was one of my biggest observations of working in tech companies is that, the, of course, when we get so attached to um, doing fast turnaround experiments that we don't try anything that might confuse consumers for a little while and they would like it better in the long run. And so I think it's absolutely a concern. And, I th so I th and actually, I, I think that's a great research topic for all of us to, con to continue to consider how we design experiments that factor in these types of learning effects, longer term effects, and so on. Well, there's, there's two things, really. I mean, that, that's definitely I think one. your orthogonal claims, right? Yeah, yeah. You're talking about long versus short. Those are He's talking about local maximum. Well, exactly. Those are both, both risks. So, so I think yeah. that, you know, that this, this incremental innovation, as you say, doesn't get the rack. But also that, you know, you're, if you have a small number of observations of that, one of the bandits doesn't look too promising, you stop exploring it, maybe you just got unlucky, and if you had explored a little bit more, you would have, you would have found that it really does work. Absolutely, so I mean, I guess the, the putting these, these costs in of complexity, I think, force you to try certain things a little bit longer, and they tend to, mm -hmm. generally looking for hypothesis tests, rather than just optimizing for the best thing is going to push you in the direction of more exploration mm -hmm. and less kind of greedy optimization. So it's actually going to go the other way. Yeah, so adding in these costs will tend to make you explore more. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess if you're trying to do scientific discovery and really understand what, does one thing work better than another, mm -hmm. then actually doing more exploration is probably good. In some sense, we, we should be thinking more about um, just what did we learn from the experiment and not just trying to get the most out of these consumers. Do you really have to be a Bayesian to do this, to sort of have some prior of what you think the, the possibilities are of these other arms? I mean, is, is that the only way to think about it? Um, I mean, I think, you know, when, when you start, if you have a, I guess the, where the prior, I think, really comes in is still there's so many things you could test. And if you mm -hmm. have, you right. know, if I'm paying workers on Mechanical Turk, I, I still can't really learn about more than, you know, 10 or so arms, especially if I'm trying to personalize things. Yeah. So I think the priors, in some sense, come in and what you send into the experiment. And then also another tuning parameter is sort of how much, how much time you spend just in completely, um, O randomized exploration over mm -hmm. those things. So broadly, I would say that you, you still have to work hard to have an experiment that you can learn something from, even if you're going to use a bandit. It just allows you to explore more things. And mm -hmm. I would say, really, a part of the, the reason I felt like I wanted to have a, a, a bandit algorithm for academics is that when you go to run a survey or a field experiment in academics, 
or industry, but especially in academics where they tend to be more one-off things, you spend so much time setting it up. You know, you go mm -hmm. to a whiteboard and you talk about all the questions and then you kind of test them on your students and then you do a pilot and then you come back and you argue, should I word it this way? Should I word it that way? And there's just massive amounts of human time basically making very uneducated guesses about what goes into the experiment. So, I mean, at least in a tech firm, you have people specializing in something and really, yeah. you know, understanding a lot of the permutations and over years kind of understanding what works. But a lot of times when, when in academics, we don't have that. And so I, think, I feel like the bandit, in a way, is a, a way to allow us to try more things and to be more open to different possibilities um, without needing to spend a zillion dollars on the pilot. Well, that's a really interesting. There's a lot more I'd like to ask you about that, but let me bring up Ron. Okay, well, yeah, Ron, I want to ask one okay, question, you, you though. Go ahead. Um, we looked at, when we do ramp ups, we start an experiment small and then ramp it up. We are exposed to Simpson's paradox, right? So we see where you, you look like you went on the first phase, you look like you went on the second phase, and then you, when you aggregate the day, you lose on both. When you do bandits, you're also exposed to this. How are you handling it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and actually, I should give a shout out. I didn't actually give any citations in my, in my talk, but there's actually a, a lot of really interesting work right now around bandits, both at Microsoft and at Facebook as big places. And, and, and people are trying to worry about these various aspects of dynamic experimentation. So I guess I would say in the, in the bandit, in principle, you should keep testing until you have separation. And so you, in some sense, should be, you but know. You have to be careful not to look at all the data when you start to shift the weight. Um, yeah, I mean, so there's you different. You lose a lot of power if you reset every time, right? If you, if you, if you, if you keep. If you say whenever I reweigh, I'm going to restart. You want to use the earlier data. Yes, too. exactly. And so there's and different ways you can. Yes, and then you there's different ways you can think about reweighting the historical data to account for these various biases. I mean, just as a simple example, that you know, in the first batch, if you had two arms that were equally good, one of them looks a little bit better, one of them looks a little bit worse. In the next batch, you give less data to the one that looked worse. And so, in some sense, you're, you're upweighting the bad data from the first batch. So there's various biases that can come into play. You know, eventually, as in gets large, these things should, uh, should uh, diminish. But um, there, there are definitely things to think okay. carefully about when you're trying to evaluate the, the data from, from these. So, so uh, Ron, I, that was an amazing talk. I love the examples, and uh, it, it reminds me of, a, of uh, Sinan Aral's favorite cartoon that he has on his door. Uh, see if I can remember it right. Uh, I used to believe that correlation implied causality, uh, but then I just took, it, took a statistics class, and now I don't. And his friend says, uh, oh, so it sounds like the statistics class changed your mind. And he goes, well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you may have missed it. That was my first slide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I missed it. Okay, I was saying <laughs> that was your first slide. So, um, so, <laughs> but it's uh, on his door. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, but but actually, the, the maybe is is important because um, it seems like maybe maybe you overstated the case a little bit. It, it's not. It, it's true that correlation doesn't always imply causality, but it seems like it should update your priors. I mean, it gives you some information that that there could I be agree. a causal so, so relationship there. I agree. So the way I view there. this is, it's a good hypothesis to test. Uh huh. But the problem is if somebody comes to me and says, look, my feature causes less churn, my prior on that is so low because when we test in controlled experiments, mm -hmm. I think I showed this a couple of codes ago, it's like one in 5,000 experiments is able to change sessions per user, which is our best measure of churn, right, usage. And so my prior is very much against anything. Is, is, so it's going to be very hard to find features that actually cause the users to use the product more. And so when somebody says, you know, my feature causes more, it's more likely that it's because, well, heavier users are likely to use your feature. Okay. Right? So something okay. else is confounding. More likely, but, but um, if there's no causal relationship, it's, you're probably not going to find a correlation most of the time. So, so the, 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 you say there's no, no. What's so that? Most of the time, the causal relationships don't exist. Yeah, most of the times they don't. Right. So finding a correlation is a good hypothesis. Increases, increases the odds that there's a correlation. Yeah, that, so, I, you know, I, it's just, yeah. I, the, the inclination is to find something and celebrate, whereas, you know, my prior rose from very unlikely by a small percentage, people think it's 95%. Find something and then explore further, would that be a, a 
good. And then run the controlled experiments, yeah, right? Yeah, then run, you know? exactly. If you're going to run controlled experiments, yes. you can't do the bandit on everything in the universe. So you have to find some things right. that you But remember, these are awesome. like big features. You know, people deploy some big feature and then they look at users that use their feature. Mm -hmm. And then because these are typically heavy users, it's an advanced mm -hmm. feature, they'll find that they're different in many ways. And one of them is they turn less. Is there anything you can learn from correlations? There is. But I'm saying like prior on something hard like churn is very low that okay. that changes. Again, my view is great hypothesis. Now run the controlled experiment. Okay. We got the platform. Right. It's cheap. Do it. We're in sync. Well, uh, let's open it up to questions. And while we're, OK, go ahead. Why don't we start, because uh, we have a mic right next to this part over here. Um, <laughs> so uh, I cannot agree more uh, that we have to be very careful with observational studies. But it's also just reality that there are many, many uh, causal understanding that we wanted to have that we cannot do controlled experiments for. And one thing that we have found that's super valuable at LinkedIn is to uh, not uh, just do uh, sort of a controlled variable, do like, you know, doubly robust, but we also develop methods that we can validate it. Uh, there are ways where you can look into history, there are ways you can like consider reverse causal that using time to as a as a um, sort of tool for you to validate. Uh, so I think it's maybe not so much about, you know, hopefully the talk doesn't leave everybody with the impression that we just shouldn't trust any observational study, but it's really just that it's very difficult compared to controlled experiment. It's a lot harder to get causal uh, observational study done right, and uh, it does require a lot more expertise than a lot of people think. Is there a question on that, or just? <laughs> I, it's really, uh, you know, like, it, it, I mean, observational studies. And, and like Yas so said, I couldn't agree more. Like, okay. a good it's, observational it's so study is better than a, you know, okay. mediocre observational study. Let's take a question. So, so I mean, okay, I, let me just comment on that, too. I mean, you know, I, I, both in academics and in tech firms, I, there's a, a lot of times where you can do good observational studies, especially using time dimensions, you know, and if you have a set of customers that's getting a feature and a set that didn't, we can find the similar customers customers that for reasons that we understand weren't exposed to it, they weren't offered it or it wasn't available, and do these kinds of panel data analyses. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I think that there's a lot of very credible and convincing panel data analyses, especially when you're, wa you know, you're watching people over time and you see some exposed to a feature and, and others that don't. Of course, I've used these in my academic studies um, and numerous occasions, and that's really one of the most common settings we have in tech firms. And so that's one reason that we need to even, ex ex I'm working on more methods or more advanced methods for doing those things, partly because I found it to be such a common scenario um, in the digital environment. Great, let's go here to Sanan. Uh, so this is for uh, Susan, but both of you. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, situations in which there's interdependence between arms and abandoned and s specifically more complex interdependence where the effects are different if you do arm one then arm two in a history or do arm two then arm one in a history and how would you think about that? Well so there's a, a, a research literature about uh, these types of things when they get to be really complex and it becomes more reinforcement learning. Um, and so I would just say, you know, you have to carefully write down your causal model and carefully design the experiment to account for that. And, and you do generally need a lot more data. Um, Is there a way you can learn those relationships along the way or do you have to write them down in advance? I just say, I mean, I, I think realistically, I think you have to come in with, with priors and restrict the space if you're doing the kinds of experiments that with, you know, thousands of users. But if you, you know, depending on your, your setting, if you have millions of users and you can, and you can, tr and you have strong treatment effects, you can try everything. Start. Of course, in case, the cases with millions of users, you're already doing a lot of the good the, things. The so you often still have, you know, small treatment effects. Uh, so, but I, I think I think it's a really exciting area of research um, to to understand these dynamic things. If you think about actually the digital tutors and so on, a, a lot of them are interested in these dynamics. It's actually a little bit depressing that they're not actually better um, than they are. Like we, like we, the digital tutors, like people learning like how math or something. Yeah, they, yeah, exactly. So and, I mean, they're personalizing that. Per, and trying to personalize that and get a sequence of instructions. And so in some sense, we see like the, we, we see the robots climbing over the wall and we're beating Go. So we think that everything is so advanced, but a lot of these products um, 
are, I feel like are, are really at their infancy in terms of really trying to ex fully explore dynamics and personalization. Great. Let's get another question right here. Yeah. Hello. Oh, okay. So I had a question for both of you, I guess. Um, I have heard before like A-B testing is slow, which I kind of agree. And then people say, okay, you, you can do multi-unbanded problem and multi-unbanded solutions and they will be faster to test. I think we are missing something in that claim. And always, I think it boils down a little bit to the symptoms paradox as well. But it's more about, especially because people tend to think that with multi unbanded problems, you can test all variants with small changes to your algorithms, which I agree, I think is not the right thing to do. But I would like to hear your thoughts because we are, I mean, that is a paradox, I believe. We are missing something when we say, hey, AB testing is too slow, doesn't work, let's go for multi unbanded problems. Ah, it works. Ah, this is better. I think that's not. We are missing something in, that, in those claims, and I can hear that a lot, so I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, so I think there's actually, there's people in the room who have probably more experience implementing them at large scale in practice. It's actually really hard to implement bandits you know, in production because you have to be integrated into the software in such a deep way. We have done that. But, but, but so, yeah, so, but I, but I guess, so you may have more insight than I do about you know, all the pitfalls in practice. But, you know, if you obviously, if you have, if you're not, cons if you don't care about understanding all 20 arms and you're just trying to find the best one, obviously you're, you're gonna be more efficient to, not, to, to throw away things that aren't working well and concentrate your data on the things that are. Um, I guess you say we're, we're missing something. Um, I don't know what, I mean, what, what? Let, let, let me add what I think yeah. here. But I think you're, first of all, I think you're generally right. I think I would separate two domains where I think multi-arm bandits work be best and where we use them are areas where the loss functions are very low in the, like news. If you're supposed to pick headline news and they're gonna be relevant on the MSNU site mm -hmm. or on the Yahoo homepage, go for multi-arm bandit because you know, what do you got to lose? You're gonna pick a headline that's valid for the next three hours. One of the reasons that I like to stay with controlled experiments that are you know, solid and you know, lots of data with low p-values is that I think the learning is that allows you to get that loop that allows you to learn, distribute the learning, and then generalize and learn from it. And there you sometimes lose if you move things too quickly, temporarily, and you know, churn all the time. So I think it's more about which domain, like in Facebook, in news, those are the domains where you should use multi arm well, Picking up on that, the other end, so suppose you're doing it for you know, uh, life-saving treatments. Is there some point at which it becomes unethical to continue an experiment on some of those arms that um, you think this is very unlikely to help this person um, or even could be dangerous for this person? I mean, yeah. uh, is, there, is there some criterion for, for deciding whether you continue to do it above and beyond uh, the data you gather? You want to take that? Well, I mean, I, I, I think that, that, that's, I think, one of the motivations for using bandits. And I guess, to come back to your question, I guess the thing that I was suggesting, which is putting in these costs, is trying to take the bandit and mm -hmm. slow it down a little bit in a principled way, yeah. to tr which tries to address your concerns. And obviously, there's trade-offs involved. I think broadly, you know, when we think about going out and like using reinforcement learning for a chatbot, you know, there's a famous Microsoft example of the chatbot that learned to be racist in 12 hours. You know, yeah. um, the, I agree with Ronnie that it, it, you need to think about what's your context and you know what's the loss function. And if I'm if I if I know what I'm trying to do is get people to save for retirement, and I'm just trying to find the right way to pitch it to them. Then and I, you know, then I think the bandit's a great way to to explore these different alternatives. But I think going back to Eric's earlier point, it's not it's no substitute for actually coming up with the different hypotheses. Like if I have radically different theories, there's still the the human element, the expertise, and the learning. And one of the reasons we want to test hypotheses is so we can learn today and come up with a better innovation tomorrow. And if you've just thrown in the kitchen sink at everything and something popped out and you don't understand why, you're not going to really learn for the future. Let's get a question on this half of the room, uh, maybe right here. We'll work the microphone over that way. Howdy. Uh, this is a question for Susan. Um, so I know you've done work in the past on like data-driven hypothesis finding, and I'm just curious if there's an interaction between that work and, and this work where you can post hoc um, do data-driven hypothesis testing on this 
scientific bandit. Um, or if you have to have a, a hypothesis, you know, a feature that you want to test specified beforehand, and if so, if that gives you gains in, in like the yeah, so what, I mean, here. I have many motivations for trying to work on this. Um, beyond just wanting to save the world, um, I also have been working <laughs> on a lot of these heterogeneous treatment effect studies, and actually in, at least in, in published economic field experiments, it's actually pretty hard to find heterogeneous treatment effects. The studies, the historical studies were not really designed to find them. They were designed, like if you do a get out the vote thing and you're going to send the same letter to everybody, you find a generic letter that works for everybody. You don't try things that are only going to work for one group and not others if you're just going to blast everybody, 100,000 people with a letter. So historically, we ran experiments that didn't have heterogeneous treatment effects and I wanted to find and create data sets that did have them to because I think people kind of had the wrong conclusion. When you look at historical data, there's no mm -hmm. heterogeneous treatment effects, but they weren't designed to get them. So I actually wanted to learn about them. And then I started partnering with organizations, these development organizations, to try to find places for personalization. And we realized we needed to prototype and learn because their own past experiments also didn't look for heterogeneity. So I guess my, po my point is that Part of what I want to do is create data sets that potentially have heterogeneity, and those, yes, absolutely, those are great data sets for then estimating policies, and we can estimate personalized policies or targeted policies um, using that data. So the bandits are a good data generating process. You have to be a little bit careful because you have these non-stationary assignment policies. There's some correlation in the data. You have to be careful about reweighting your data properly. But if you do all the right things, you can actually do this post hoc analysis on this data. And, and an important aspect of that clearly is that without the heterogeneous treatment effect, you might find no effect on average, and you may think, oh, there's nothing you can do, when in reality, it, there are some very positive effects, some negative effects, and, and if, you, if you were able to be nuanced about that, you'd, you'd see that there are lots of things, lots of policies that have an effect. Exactly, and that's like with the worker training in Rhode Island, you know, there were, there were these men who were getting discouraged mm -hmm. by their training. Like, I had this great assembly line job, and now you're telling me to go be a home health aide, and, you know, I don't want to change diapers, so I'm just gonna stay home and, you so know, they actually had a negative effect. From yeah, the exactly. So there's a, there's, it looked like there's groups of people who were harmed by the treatment, and so that's that's the opportunity for improvement. So, right over here, uh, uh, there's someone with Mike. Yep, go ahead. Uh, my question is for uh, Susan. Uh, so I agree that uh, bandits help you arrive at the best arm uh, really fast. So, but that is mostly applicable in digital settings where you can observe the outcome immediately. But in the case of public policy, that you don't uh, observe immediately more often than not. So how do you uh, apply this? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, and I mean, I've done some work on surrogate outcomes that you can use to, like a short-term outcome that predicts the long-term. But actually, when, when I teach executives about artificial intelligence generally and all of these techniques specifically, I generally say, hey, this stuff is going to really give you a big kick if you, for problems you can measure quickly. Mm -hmm. And no, this is. You know, you have to think about it differently for longer term stuff. So, and I, I think that's why part of the reason tech firms get to be short term focused is yeah. you have this great way to kind of keep climbing up the local hill and getting the quick feedback and running the quick experiments and improving and improving and improving. And, and on the vectors where you have to wait a year to figure it out, nobody wants to work on that. Um, and, and you can't, you know, you can't improve as fast. This is a really important point. I think we're going to explore this further yeah. in the yeah. afternoon yep. panel, so, so because yep. it's, it's an it's a issue. Um, let, me, uh, let me bring it back a little bit to some of the academics. You said a couple of interesting things towards the end of your talk, uh, Susan. I want to get both of you to remark um, about how this affects hypothesis testing in the scientific community. So one question is, you know, should we still be using t-statistics in this? Are they meaningful when you're making these kinds of adjustments on the fly? And then a more sort of uh, uh, broader question is, should, can we think of the, the academic community as a multi-arm bandit? So not, you know, there's not one, you don't have to do it all by yourself, but if you think of it more broadly, there's a meta problem going on where lots of different people are exploring different things and there's just some way of aggregating that in a, in a more useful way than we've been doing it. Yeah, well, I think obviously this whole crisis in science and replicability and, and meta-analysis is mm -hmm. trying to address that whole problem that we keep. Uh, Are they doing with the kind of 
depth of analysis that you put applied to this, though. I mean, it, it seems like Pro it, probably not. But, but but then there's another I think really interesting phenomenon that I would love to learn more about from the folks here. That I think we're seeing a lot of movement in tech companies that are doing lots and lots of experiments to rethink the way that we evaluate the tests. And Dominic Coey's over here. He has, they have a nice paper at Facebook. Um, I think what you're presenting here at the conference, right? About um, about uh, how do you think about it when you're running lots of tests and most of them aren't actually doing anything. Um, a couple of firms that I work with have moved to Bayesian uh, analysis in their A-B testing platforms to explicitly account for the fact that you're doing lots of tests and mm -hmm. you should yeah. be learning over time and having priors. And I, I, I do think it's a little bit but schizophrenic. Then, but then your, your to test think statistics of. are sort of harder to interpret. Yeah, I mean, Maybe it's not yeah. So I think we're all right. We're all collectively figuring it out. Like, it doesn't really make sense to run ten thousand experiments a year and look at everyone as an individual. Like, I think it's pretty clear that that's not the right way to think <laughs> yeah, about it. Yeah. But, but what we're all figuring out together what to replace that with, and then maybe some of that I think will feed back into academics uh, as well. I think that the, but the innovation is going to come from, well, from you're, companies. You're, you're doing that, Ron. How do you how do you address that that issue? I yeah, mean, so these false um, positives that you're inevitably going to get. I think we're generally in agreement. I mean, the way we do this at Microsoft is that we allow people to run most ideas of documented fail, actually. So the ones that are successful, we look for either very low p-values or we require them to replicate. So, for example, in the most, you know, analytical team, like, what, like the relevance What's a very team, low p-value, just to give us a, you know? Uh, less than 0 0.001. Mm -hmm. um, and then the if you're somewhere around 0 0.05, like 0 0.01, you run it again, and now you've got two p-values below 0.05. You know you can use Fisher's method to combine mm -hmm. them and see that this generally is is trustworthy. Now. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question uh, right over here. Yeah, thank you, Susan and Ron. Um, I enjoyed the discussion on uh, the Sam Simpsons paradox, and I'm not sure if you may, if the, the the solution was made clear. Is inverse variance weighting relevant for that? So in, Th in Thompson sampling, you can record the probability with which each observation was made, and then afterwards you could uh, reweight each observation by the inverse of the probability with which it was made. Is that relevant to this, to reduce uh, Simpson's paradox bias? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so you can read like the way, that, like the simple example that I gave, where you, you something does badly and then you give it less data later, which then overweights the the spuriously bad data. You can. Uh, upweight the batches and in order to, to balance that back out. And that works even if you're dynamically making those kinds of adjustments? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any comments on that? All right. Well, thanks very much to both uh, Ron and Susan.